uh, now I would like uh, to uh, launch our first uh, uh, round table, achieving the environmental targets uh, with the uh, farm to fork strategies strategy. Uh, our panelists are going to join me on stage. Please give them a round of applause. So I would like to uh, invite our panelists to join me on stage now for the first round table. You have uh, the uh, possibility. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I'm just going to pass the uh, sanitizer around. So we're cleaning the stage at the same time, although it's uh, sparkling clean. So you will have uh, the uh, possibility for those of us who are following us uh, remotely uh, to ask uh, some questions in French or English. And you can also uh, use the, uh, uh, the hashtag uh, Farm for Ag. So we uh, will now start our first roundtable focusing on a, a topic um, that uh, is uh, uh, of a paramount uh, importance. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, uh, reminded uh, uh, Europeans uh, of the uh, strategic um, aspect of uh, agriculture. And uh, according uh, to an FAO index, uh, food staples uh, saw their prices increase by 30% in one year. By 2050, we'll have to feed 9.7 uh, billion people worldwide. Uh, uh, while uh, contributing uh, to uh, global uh, food uh, security and ensuring sustainable agricultural production. We need uh, to uh, make uh, healthy and nutritious food available while taking into account uh, the importance of uh, uh, human health uh, rela as related to animals and ecosystems. Uh, uh, we need to find solutions uh, that uh, uh, take into account uh, reality as well. And uh, you know, European consumers often have expectations and preferences uh, that can be uh, contradictory. The European Green Deal, as well as the uh, Farm to Fork uh, strategy and uh, the uh, EU uh, strategy for biodiversity by uh, 2030 describe a, a global and long-term plan. However, uh, are uh, those uh, actions and commitments uh, realistic? And the uh, players in the rural world uh, have a role to play while ensuring uh, the uh, economic, environmental and social development of rural areas. And we are also at uh, a crossroads in terms of uh, cap negotiations. Member states uh, uh, will have uh, to choose uh, uh, concrete actions in order to ensure sustainable agricultural production uh, while protecting biodiversity, human health and uh, animal welfare. Uh, while uh, uh, adapting to climate change and uh, um, decreasing our carbon footprint. So, um, I'm now going to, well, if you'll allow me, just going to give you a bit of sanitizer. So, uh, as I said, uh, our panelists uh, are with us uh, uh, now. Uh, Eric Thirouin is the uh, president uh, of the General Association of Wheat and Other Cereal Producers, AGPB. Pierre Dubreuil, general director of the French Office for Biodiversity, or OFB. And uh, Sébastien Treyer, director general of IDRI. Uh, thank you for being here today. So I will uh, start uh, with you, Mr. Thirouin. Uh, you are the president of the General Association of uh, Wheat and Other uh, Cereal Producers. Uh, uh, you uh, manage with your uh, son a, uh, a family farm of 160 hectares uh, in uh, the uh, Centre Val de la Region in France. You uh, produce uh, uh, common uh, wheat, uh, durum wheat, uh, barley, irrigated maize, uh, and uh, rapeseed. Uh, you um, are now uh, chairing uh, the uh, uh, agricultural uh, chamber of your department and you are the head of uh, AGPB. Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here right before the uh, French uh, presidency of the EU. And I'm very happy to talk about this uh, important subject from farm 
to fork. It's a very important topic, and uh, from what we heard in the last uh, contributions, I, I think there's a real question. Is the future of our planet, the future of Europe, uh, and the, the expectations of uh, our citizens, are they topics that uh, will entail uh, degrowth or not? I think it's really a key question when it comes to subjects related to farm to fork. And we can actually wonder if it's always farm to fork or fork to farm sometimes. There's a real discussion here. You know, citizens uh, have many demands uh, and want a lot. They expect a lot from farmers. And they want to know what is being done. So that's the first uh, issue. Now, I don't know if you want me to give you details uh, right away uh, on the, the Green Deal and the issues uh, that impact the farm to fork strategy. We have about seven studies that were carried out. The first studies were carried out uh, very far away, abroad. The latest studies, well, the last uh, one, the study of the uh, commission was uh, done only in August, and the cap was already well on the way, the new cap. And when you look at all these studies, you see that as regards wheat, you have percentages of production between 17 to 49 percent, depending on the studies, for grains 15 to 30 percent, for all seeds 15 to 60 percent of production, and for beet 20 to 28 percent. So we see here that even in the most positive studies, we have drastic uh, decreases in production. So you might say that is positive for the climate because the Green Deal a challenge, the first challenge of the Green Deal is a climate challenge. That's the way we understand it. But we see that the GRC study and the Cal University study who have looked at these aspects around climate change uh, showed that uh, releasing less CO2 on our territory would be offset by imports and by the production that we're going to uh, send uh, abroad and, and relocate abroad. So they'll be counterbalanced. And there's something wrong here. We have indicators that lead to these results. What are they? Well, those indicators are only reduction indicators, i.e. reduction of phytosanitary products by 50%, uh, reduction of fertilizers. Of course, we also have to work on, on losses and, and leaks, but even once you don't have any more leaks or losses, you have to reduce your phytosanitary uh, uh, products use and also have 10% uh, uh, of agricultural uh, surfaces dedicated to biodiversity via non-production. So we see here that the rationale each time is the same. And this is what is problematical to me. If the future of our planet, if the future of Europe is degrowth, if it's to stop producing, then it's an issue. And all the more so, as we know that uh, greenhouse gases and climate change are the main problem. But there's only one factory in the world that can actually transform greenhouse gases, uh, CO2 into oxygen and, and carbon. Only one. And that factory is actually a photosynthesis. It's the only factory that exists. So through plants, through forests, through crops. So if we stop producing biomites, if we stop this photosynthesis uh, machinery, we're going to have the adverse uh, effect, uh, the contrary to what is expected. So I think that's really the first problem I wanted to point at at this stage. Thank you very much, Mr. Tiroin, for all this. Now, Mr. Dubreuil, in January 2020, you were appointed by the uh, President of the Republic, uh, Director General of the uh, OFB, the French Office for Biodiversity. It's a merge between uh, the French Biodiversity Agency and the uh, National 
office for the fauna. You have the floor. Thank you. Some of you know the uh, OFB, the French Office for Biodiversity. But since this is a round table, uh, I'm not going to present it. And I'd rather have a dialogue with uh, Eric Tirouin and Sébastien Trier. Just a few words on OFB. OFB helps players go towards uh, a better taking into account of, of uh, biodiversity in their activities. Of course, we have other missions uh, related to the environment. I won't go back on that. But if we talk about agroecological transition, it's one of the missions of our office. So we want to support players and not impose anything or uh, be uh, uh, confronted to them. We all are aware of, of how huge this challenge is. The transition and the figures Eric Tirouin mentioned uh, for 2030 and the farm to fork or fork to farm, uh, all this is quite dizzying. We are in a situation that is uh, similar to that of the after-war period when we had to feed uh, the population. We need a, a new model. It's a real revolution that is uh, uh, about to happen. And Eric Tirouin mentioned it, and, and actually the OFB works with Eric Tirouin. Uh, the uh, uh, figures he announced Minus 50% of uh, pesticides in France, for instance. Uh, minus 50% of uh, nutrient uh, leaks. Uh, minus 50% of antibiotics for uh, cattle. And 10% of the uh, usable agricultural land used for uh, organic uh, uh, crops. Well, this cannot happen from one day to the next. And we need to know what kind of production we're going to have. And all the players in the agricultural world are perfectly aware of the pressures that are actually threats uh, for the agriculture. When we talk about agricultural transition, very often we are under the uh, impression that we have, on the one hand, ecology, and on the other hand, uh, agriculture. It's like saying if you're an environmentalist, you have to uh, systematically take your bike. But within a few decades, we've transformed the landscapes. Uh, we destroyed the agroecological infrastructure, like hedges, ponds. And we damaged the tools of the farmers. This is the first uh, uh, factor. We are currently trying to revert the trend, and this is absolutely necessary, regarding uh, wetlands. Uh, you know, minus 60% of wetlands in 40 years. Those are the figures. What are the consequences? We're talking about ponds, about uh, all sorts of wetlands. So, of course, if you so if you do away with wetland, you do away with ecosystemic services, and you also increase the temperature because wetlands as well as hedges uh, have uh, an impact there. Wetlands lower the temperature, just like uh, hedges uh, can fight against uh, heavy winds. So this has a, a direct impact on biodiversity. Another factor which people are aware of now is uh, the fact that the soil is getting poorer and poorer. And our land has more um, uh, fertilizers in it, phytosanitary products, uh, the land is, is still too much. Uh, farmers are well aware of, of this. So what are we doing? 
for this. And to go back to, Eric Thiron, to what Eric Thiron said, uh, I think we have to focus on production. You know, OFB, my office is not an NGO. I'm not for degrowth. I think it's, uh, it's, it's not a sustainable uh, way to see things. We need for farmers to live and citizens also um, are asking for a different agriculture, more in line with their expectations as consumers. But they also want farmers to be able to live from their uh, job. So what should we do? If we think that biodiversity is a production factor and must be integrated in production, I think it's the only solution. And the purpose of the transition is actually to try and see that biodiversity brings to production and is no enemy of production. With beads has a, a plan called Agrifone. Well, it's a small plan uh, considering the challenges, but it's a, a, an experiment. And, and specialists could tell you more after this uh, round table on this. And this will help farmers and all the players in the agricultural field to, for instance, have more uh, grass strips of better quality, increased biodiversity with uh, more wildlife. And this would also uh, be positive for hunting and hunters. So this is just one example of a solution. There are many more I could uh, talk about. But this is a mindset at OFB. We want to be with and not against. We're trying to look at a transition, a change in the long run. And I'll stop here because it's uh, it's an interactive session. I'm not here to give a lecture. Thank you very much. Before we hear our last uh, speaker, let me remind you that you have the possibility to ask any questions you have uh, online. Thank you very much. Sébastien Trier, you are with us. You are Director General of IDRI since uh, January 2019. You're also the President of the uh, Scientific and Technical uh, uh, French uh, Fund for the World uh, Fund. And you're a member of the lead faculty of the Network Earth System Governance. Uh, you, you thought a lot about the Farm to Fork strategy. Uh, what do you think about this? Yes, absolutely. And Mr. Thierry and Mr. Dubreuil already uh, talked about this subject, and I and I agree with what they said. I think that what's good with the farm to fork is that we focus on biodiversity, but not only. The idea is to see what's behind biodiversity. For instance, water quality, and as Pierre Dubreuil was mentioning. Biodiversity can also be a, a factor that is important in production. And just as uh, the carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, vision, we see that a long-term change is necessary in all sectors of the economy, whether the automobile industry or any other industry. And we also have to choose our timing. We cannot uh, postpone forever. So I'm just telling you this so that you, you understand that there are many industries that are uh, concerned by this long-term transformation that is key. So when you look at the agricultural s sector and uh, when you listen to what science is saying uh, that we must do in the long run for nitrogen, pesticides, for instance, you see that the trends are completely different than the one that we are following right now. And this is striking. We must try to have a very deep change by 2050. And what I'm trying to say also is that, you know, there's nothing really new here. Uh, we've been talking about this at IDRI, uh, we need structural change. Uh, let me try to uh, be a bit more uh, precise. These long-term goals 
are not sustainable, according to INRA, uh, if we cannot work on the, the, the problem of, of needs of re-diversification. This is what I call a structural change. How can we actually uh, deal with the need for diversification? And in the agricultural field also, uh, as Stefan Le Foll mentioned, uh, we have uh, an upscaling uh, strategy also. And the Green Deal is working on upscaling a lot. These uh, ec economic strategies uh, come to, to complement other strategies. So in the farming industry, and especially the uh, animal husbandry sector, uh, we are talking about reducing production. Now, we're not talking necessarily about degrowth, uh, but it's a very complicated uh, issue. And we're working also with uh, dairy product uh, producers. And we have to see if we can set up an economic strategy that increases value while diminishing volumes. So more value for less volume. You can generalize things, but uh, some initiatives can be inspiring. So those are the structural changes I uh, wanted to mention. What seems important to me now is to try to see when we can set up these structural changes and how public policies can help these economic strategies I just briefly mentioned be uh, credible, feasible, acceptable, so as to engage in this transition. So I'll try to be brief, but uh, I have a lot to say. Uh, I've got so much to say, I'm sorry, but uh, yes, go ahead, you can. Um, let me try to mention the long-term, mid-term, and short-term. In the long run, the scenarios that we see, uh, the Idri scenario, for instance, but it's not the only way, one that I'm interested in. You have other scenarios with uh, no more animal production whatsoever, for instance. But the rationale of all these scenarios uh, is that it should benefit the environment, human health. Uh, they are very uh, profound changes in uh, the food diets. So we need to listen to consumers and try and uh, set up uh, a policy that would really translate these changes into reality. Uh, more fruits, vegetables, uh, more balance between uh, uh, vegetable and uh, animal proteins, etc. And there's another scenario according to which uh, the EU is a net exporter of calories and keeps exporting grains uh, to other countries in spite of this agroecological transition. And the main reason for that is that if you reduce well, if you have strategies aiming at reducing volume in animal production, you have part of the vegetable production that is lost also. And when you look at 2050, you see that we are still an exporting region. Uh, we import soy from Brazil. I. Uh, have to say this because there are people here in this room whose job is to import soy from uh, Brazil. So I'm just saying that we're not talking about degrowth for Europe, but for some uh, uh, sectors, these uh, economic strategies are extremely complicated. Now, midterm 2030, we are trying to focus on the low carbon national strategy. There are key questions here of re diversification, a reintroduction of uh, legumes, and uh, also work with dairy producers. What's the future of dairy products by uh, 2030? That is a, a recurrent uh, question. And there's always the economic rationale behind everything. So we worked with uh, production players, cooperatives, and also the agribusiness field. I'm interested in what's going on in Brittany, the Brit territory I come from. You have farmers and SMEs. 
and then the big uh, agribusinesses. The question we asked with these players is uh, how many jobs can be created by 2030 if we follow a strategy of uh, diversification and if we focus on value rather than volume. We started working with these players and we opened the discussion and we realized that there would be a plus 10 percent in terms of, of job creations, plus 10 percent of uh, more jobs created. So it's not a degrowth strategy. It's a, a strategy that uh, entails structural changes. Now, that leads us to say this is why I think that the 2030 goals of the farm to fork are interesting in, in this prospect. We have to see where we want to be in the long run and what are the realistic targets in the shorter run and what this can trigger. And in the short run, it can uh, actually help public policies and decision making. We need support measures for farmers. We need to focus on the cost of transition. If uh, the volume goes down, of course, it will have an impact on what they earn. It talks also about uh, uh, remunerating ecosystemic services on a more permanent basis. Uh, we have nine years ahead of us before we reach 2030, and I think that these questions are really uh, important. We need to think how we can use our innovation capacity, uh, whether robots, artificial intelligence, and put all this into our diversification strategy. And the main driver, according to me, and we've been talking about this for a long time now, uh, it's nice to work on diversification, but what about markets? We have to really think about this. What are the policies we can set up and where to start so that uh, the re-diversification of the bioeconomy can happen? We need synergies between productions and not only work on uh, economies of scale. Oh, we need to re-diversify, of course, but how and in which sectors. This is what we need to work together. And we need to work on the policies that will help us go in this direction also. And as Sylvain was saying earlier, uh, we need to build a real uh, domestic market that is a real level playing field. And uh, Christian Lambert was uh, saying many questions come around this issue. And also, in this upscaling rationale, we must be careful of competition and uh, trade and have positive trading schemes. So I think we should uh, have lower targets maybe, see how we can renegotiate things and to make sure that our deadlines are uh, realistic for these structural changes. And we need an economic strategy that is no degrowth, but rather differentiation, according to me. Thank you very much. We're going to hear the questions from the audience in a little uh, while. Pierre Dubreuil, you did take lots of notes. Uh, and maybe you want to talk about these structural changes? Yes, well, I share uh, Sebastian's point of view on the whole. I would like to underscore the importance of uh, Re reorienting uh, public finance, public funding, because if we want these schemes to be acceptable for the farming world in France at European uh, level also, we need to make sure that public policies actually include all these changes so that the funding be directed and Sebastian mentioned uh, the uh, remuneration of ecosystemic services. Uh, all this is fundamental. We cannot picture a transition without a very strong political will from a domestic point of view, but also we need to protect the agricultural world from external effects. Um, thinking about mirror clauses, for instance. You cannot impose things on yourself that you don't impose on others. So if you can import products and and then penalize the producer, you, you have to think about uh, reciprocal uh, 
measures. In this way, uh, the strategy will be sustainable and viable for all players. Also, as uh, Sebastian mentioned, markets and industries, sectors. You know, sectors are structured and there's a market because they are uh, expectations from citizens. Whenever you have an expectation uh, and needs, of course, you have a market and this market is undergoing a transition. So the difficulty is to actually understand citizens' expectations, to meet their expectations, lower production, of course, uh, that needs to take place, but the market needs to actually evolve in order to better meet citizens' expectations around dairy production, animal uh, production, etc. as Sebastian was mentioning earlier. And a change in the model is not necessarily calling this model into question, but making sure that all the players are protected also. And this is absolutely possible and necessary, including biodiversity in the schemes. There's a strategy in France, it's actually the third strategy. You know, in France, we like strategies. We had a first one, second one. There's a third one we're working on, and it can only succeed if it's an interministerial strategy. If it's not, it's bound to fail and it will have a limited impact. But if you consider that the national strategy must actually take into consideration all the ministries, including the Ministry of Agriculture, then I think we can reach our targets and uh, support this wonderful transition. Thank you very much, Mr. Dubreuil, for this. I, and I suggest, because we're really at the heart of the debate, I suggest we take a few questions. I see there are questions in the room. Well, this, I'm going to ask you the question, and uh, there's one coming from a, a person online. Eric, where to start for this transition? For instance, for a grain producer producing a cereal for uh, animals, uh, concretely, how does a farmer work to meet uh, consumers' expectations and where to uh, get this know-how? Well, what I was saying earlier is that what shocks me in the Green Deal and um, in all the different uh, challenges is the question remains, what should we do and how can we do it? If I go back to the four criteria that Europe gives us, uh, reducing phytosanitary products, for instance, uh, absolutely antibiotics should not use, be used automatically. Same for, for uh, uh, fertilizers, phytosanitary products. If you're not ill, you can do without drugs or if you have a, a, another type of treatment. If you have a child who is uh, sick, for instance, and has a fever, you can put your child uh, in cold water to help the fever drop. But if it doesn't drop, then you will have to uh, give him a uh, some sort of medicine. In France, we gathered 44 different associations and organizations who are thinking about alternatives. We need alternatives to phytosanitary products. And we have about 100 of these alternatives. We are uh, telling uh, farmers about them. And we don't want a ban before we have an alternative. And alternatives are necessary because we will have bans. Second, fertilizers. Of course, we need zero leaks. We need to reduce leaks as much as possible. So this entails decision-making, monitoring. We need to think about how we uh, introduce fertilizers. But uh, of course, we should not eat anything uh, because we need to be healthy. But we need to eat, and we cannot start uh, dying because we don't have enough food. A third challenge, uh, organic food. I'd like to talk about consumers. This year in France, we have, when it comes to milk and eggs, we have uh, a very big price problems uh, because farmers cannot live from their production. And for a cereal, we're 
we've reached the, the balance point only, but there comes a time when uh, we are going to be in dire straits if we keep going this way, in this direction. So if you wants 25% of organic products to be consumed, not a problem. We can produce that. It's not a problem. If it's profitable, if it's uh, interesting, we can do it. And we've proved that. So I think we must really focus on consumers, their expectations. And aside from uh, organic farming, we want to also certify agriculture. We call it uh, environmental certification in France. It's a movement that seems extremely important to us. We need to put a label on everything we do, and we need to raise awareness. We've uh, seen many changes in our practices, but people are not aware of them. And the fourth challenge, uh, of course, with Pierre Dubreuil, uh, we worked on biodiversity. Uh, we've committed uh, for cereal growers with the OFB to work on taking stock of all the different practices for biodiversity. I brought with me a book that we wrote together and uh, we um, included nine recommendations to farmers. We are translating uh, this uh, uh, into action uh, in uh, Nouvelle Aquitaine, southwest of France. And so uh, we want to show uh, what uh, biodiversity can uh, bring to farmers. So uh, we think that this is a fundamental. Uh, it's about uh, purchase, hedges, uh, about uh, crop rotation, uh, the uh, size uh, of um, arable land. So um, this is all related to uh, sources of biodiversity. I think that this is uh, the path that we need to choose. We need to be proactive and not defensive. And by doing so, uh, we'll be able to address uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and uh, climate change mitigation at the same time. Uh, this is a major challenge uh, for the uh, French EU presidency. We uh, are uh, following a decarbonization uh, path uh, and uh, carbon credit. It, I think it's a very virtuous way of uh, supporting changes and agricultural transitions. Uh, thank you very much for your, un for your answer. Uh, Sébastien Treyer, do you agree with uh, Eric Tirouin? I'll let you answer and then I will have another question. Well, this is absolutely, this is uh, related to all uh, that I have explained so far. Uh, we uh, should n not just uh, negotiate on our goals uh, by uh, 2030, but uh, we should also see this as an opportunity rather than a constraint. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this can be done uh, by uh, uh, upgrading our production and uh, by adding a premium, maybe. And uh, I think, well, w what I tried to explain before when I talked about uh, the markets, uh, uh, the, I was thinking about uh, organic uh, agriculture as well. Uh, this goal of 20% uh, of organic production in Europe by 2030, well, this is not necessarily related to uh, markets uh, and uh, consumer expectations. And this is what we saw on uh, oil seeds. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of it, uh, but it, it never worked. Jean-Marc Ménard published a very interesting study in 2013, and the main conclusion was the, the following. Uh, the uh, um, uh, contracts need to be stable enough in order to guarantee uh, the markets. And uh, I think that is why uh, Farm to Fork is the right uh, policy framework across sectors, across branches, uh, because uh, we uh, think to, we need to think about uh, the uh, downstream aspect as well. We need to make sure that uh, consumers uh, are not uh, um, submitted to these uh, market variations if the chicken or the egg, really. So it's about overproducing or underproducing So uh, these uh, new sectors and this uh, diversification that I was talking about, well, I think that this is what we need uh, to boost, really, 
to give you another very tangible example, uh, very quickly, if you can. Yes, I, I'm always afraid to uh, focus too much on concept. Uh, so uh, in Normandy, uh, the uh, water agency is uh, funding uh, various uh, uh, projects uh, in order uh, to uh, finance uh, some um, low input uh, bio material industries. And um, I think that this is very interesting uh, because uh, here we can see uh, that uh, environmental agencies are supporting these uh, strateg strategies and not uh, 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 paying uh, uh, players uh, to do this. Uh, well, we have a question uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Treyer. Um, uh, in uh, France, uh, we uh, French households uh, dedicate 13 percent uh, uh, of uh, their revenue uh, to food. It's 10 uh, percent in Germany and 8 percent uh, in the UK. Uh, what can you comment on this? Well, I think that it's a very interesting question. Well, from all of my discussions uh, with the uh, French and European farmers, uh, well, uh, none of them is uh, satisfied uh, with the uh, drop in prices for consumers, because it's uh, not economically viable for the industry. So uh, the first part of my answer is the following. Uh, this uh, uh, decline uh, in the uh, uh, this decline in uh, food prices and the uh, decline in the share of uh, uh, food uh, budget in the overall budget uh, of households, uh, well, this is not economically uh, viable. And uh, in uh, uh, France, uh, we can see uh, that uh, uh, the uh, greater the decline in the uh, food budget, uh, the greater the rate of obesity. So uh, this is the trend. So what can we do with it? I do not know how we could have a, a profitable sector uh, without uh, um, increasing prices. And this is why we need a European food policy. And this leads to other questions. How can we make sure that uh, the most disadvantaged, the most vulnerable uh, citizens uh, uh, can have access to nutritious food and not just uh, to have discount of supermarkets? Uh, um, because we need to make uh, nutritious quality accessible to all. So uh, we need to have a, a social uh, uh, food policy. So this is a discussion that is already there, but that we need to develop further. And uh, we also uh, need uh, to uh, change uh, the uh, decisions uh, we uh, take in terms of uh, lifestyle. And if we don't do that, I think that we are doomed to have a, a new uh, demonstrations uh, from the uh, Yellow Vest movement in France, for instance. Uh, um, and so we, we need to make sure that uh, everyone can access uh, nutritious food uh, while at the same time making sure that this is economically viable for the industry. Do you think that this is a priority today? Well, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable uh, listening to this. Uh, uh, we cannot uh, imagine so here I'm talking about uh, biodiversity. Uh, we can't uh, see it as both an opportunity and a constraint if we cannot allow uh, farmers uh, to make a livelihood from their production. So a 25% uh, um, goal of uh, organic production if uh, uh, the uh, producers cannot make a living of this. Well, I, uh, for myself, uh, produce uh, milk and eggs, and uh, I need to make it viable. It needs to be profitable. And it's uh, uh, so if uh, we are uh, uh, done grading everything, and if we consider that it's 8% uh, uh, of household uh, budget uh, in the UK, 10% in Germany, and 13% uh, in France, and if we think that 13% is too much in France, I think that we, that we are just wrong. And France is a, a specific country. Uh, we know that uh, food plays a major role in the French culture, which explains that there's a higher share in household budgets. Uh, but this is an oxymoron. 
we need to make sure uh, that uh, producers uh, get paid uh, uh, the right price. Uh, and we need to make sure that uh, our uh, uh, European strategy is included in a, uh, a fully-fledged uh, European policy. And if we do not do that, uh, uh, then uh, we will not uh, be uh, aligned uh, with uh, the reality of uh, European farmers. So, yes, I agree with what's been said. And so I think that this goes back to the uh, structuring of uh, the industry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so the increase uh, in uh, food prices, uh, so uh, uh, who does it uh, benefit? Uh, would, uh, who, would you who would like to answer that question? Well, this is the discussion that we've been having for so many years in France with the uh, Egalin Act. Uh, how can we uh, allocate, distribute uh, the uh, value of food products uh, across uh, retailers, producers, etc.? So, in uh, the uh, cereal uh, branch, uh, which I know the best, I think that we are working with uh, other mechanisms. And uh, it's a sector uh, that uh, is uh, on uh, operating on global markets, uh, meaning that uh, wheat prices uh, is not uh, dependent uh, on the uh, price at which a, a kilo of flour, for instance, uh, will be sold uh, um, in supermarkets. So uh, the uh, price uh, of uh, cereals is not dependent on the uh, selling price uh, in supermarkets. So we saw that uh, prices uh, doubled, but this is related to uh, climate issues, geopolitical issues, uh, because uh, uh, greener is uh, more expensive. Well, that's an issue, but uh, if you remember uh, the um, uh, latest uh, uh, hunger protests uh, in North Africa, well, uh, this is really a problem. Uh, consumption is increasing, but production is not. Uh, and it means uh, that uh, when you get a, a climate glitch, then um, everything just tumbles down. So uh, this is uh, uh, why at AGPB we say that we need to produce uh, more and better and uh, not just to decrease uh, production. So we need to find the right balance. Now, um, for other sectors, other branches, for instance, uh, meat or diary, uh, there's a more direct link to the uh, selling prices uh, in uh, supermarkets. So I think that uh, organizations need to work more on transparency, and I hope that the uh, Egalin 2 Act uh, in France uh, will uh, help us uh, have a better distribution uh, of uh, uh, these uh, prices. And uh, as I just said, uh, uh, greener is more expensive. Uh, but there's also an issue of traceability that we haven't um, touched on yet. Uh, when can a consumer know that uh, uh, the uh, food product deserves to be more expensive? Well, it's done to traceability. So uh, is it necessarily black and white a between a conventional agriculture and organic agriculture? And uh, there are so many rules in the European Union that do not exist uh, elsewhere in the world. So uh, I think that uh, we uh, have an exceptional level of uh, quality in Europe. And uh, this goes back to the uh, mirror closes uh, of the uh, previous uh, speakers. But uh, this information is difficult for us to share with our European consumers. But this is also a driver for uh, the uh, transition, because if we can do that, uh, we'll be able to increase the prices of organic products uh, with uh, consumers still uh, buying these products. So I think that we can uh, do a lot with this and with mirror clauses. If we can do that, we'll make a lot of progress. But we need to be politically uh, pragmatic. And it's a, a non-binary situation. Uh, we need to find the right balance, as in any diet. Thank you very much. So now 
I suggest uh, we uh, move into uh, the uh, questions asked uh, by the people in the audience here with us. Uh, uh, please uh, ask uh, for a, a microphone uh, if you want to ask a question. And uh, there will be uh, uh, protections on the microphone uh, for uh, health reasons. Please introduce yourself uh, before you ask your question. Uh, good uh, morning. Alain Moulinier from the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, regarding the scenario or scenario uh, mentioned by Sébastien Treyer, I would like to know uh, what is uh, being done uh, about uh, grass uh, land. Uh, okay. Well, this uh, question of uh, 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 grass uh, uh, acreage uh, is uh, directly related uh, to carbon neutrality. Uh, that's uh, the uh, uh, typhoon uh, scenario after scenario. There are uh, many different scenarios that uh, uh, were established. In the uh, TIFAL scenario, uh, grass strips are extremely important uh, uh, because uh, we also focused on uh, biodiversity and water quality. So uh, this is a fundamental. And uh, cross strips uh, are also a way of closing the loop uh, for uh, fertility. So um, uh, meadows uh, uh, can play a major role. And I think that uh, it uh, would be uh, interesting uh, to look into this more. And this is actually a discussion that we have uh, with the meat uh, branches. Uh, what uh, role can uh, grass strips or meadows uh, play in this uh, so uh, we're not going uh, to move from uh, uh, to uh, have all of the uh, current intensive systems or switch to an extensive systems, but uh, there is so much to gain in terms of uh, meat quality, uh, market recognition, etc. So there's a, a lot to bring uh, on top uh, of uh, environmental challenges. Thank you. And another question that was asked uh, online, uh, Rabar Quiz uh, from uh, VVF uh, European. Agroforestry uh, can be a, a good uh, environmental solution uh, to work on uh, uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. However, this innovation is not uh, used enough uh, uh, by uh, farmers, including in arable crops. So what should we change uh, to make sure that agroforestry becomes a more interesting solution to farmers? Well, I know uh, quite a few colleagues uh, that are involved in agroforestry. And uh, they uh, can uh, make it uh, profitable. And uh, beyond uh, all of the benefits uh, that you've just mentioned, uh, it is actually quite economically viable. And agroforestry is really based on a long-term approach. In the short term, uh, uh, there is a reduction uh, in uh, production. And it's about also the valuation of trees. And this is how we can uh, reach some kind of balance. So uh, we can't ask uh, all uh, farmers uh, to uh, to switch to agroforestry because it's quite different um, uh, farming a plant uh, or a tree. However, uh, uh, it, it could be interesting. But uh, since you have to be based on a long-term approach, uh, it, it could be an obstacle. But uh, for us, it's uh, not a problem at all. Uh, it can be done in a very good way uh, for economic and environmental reasons. But I don't think that it's uh, the only solution. There are so many other solutions to promote biodiversity. It's one of the solutions. And I think that's an important message as well. I tried to uh, mention it before, uh, but... Um, we need to stop having people believe that there's, that there's just one single solution. Uh, there isn't. Uh, there are many different solutions. And uh, uh, so this is a European forum, but we're in France. So uh, what is so great about France is the beauty of its landscapes, uh, um, uh, the seaside, the vineyards, the mountains, etc. So this is also what diversity is about. It's this uh, diversity of crops, of landscapes. And so this is what diversity is about. Uh, so uh, there will be uh, several solutions, agroforestry being one of them, but not the only one. 
So we uh, still have a few minutes uh, to have another question from the audience here. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Yana Yuchates. I'm the Secretary General from, for Coursera. I have a question to uh, Mr. Dubreuil. Um, what kind of uh, discussions do you have uh, with uh, uh, similar agencies uh, in uh, other member states, uh, say um, in Brussels or elsewhere? As part of your initiative, do you have uh, discussions with your European counterparts? Thank you. Uh, your question is uh, very clear, and my answer is very straightforward. Yes and no. Yes, uh, because, well, maybe I should start with the no, actually. Yes, it's better to end on yes. Yes, and it makes more sense. OFB uh, is a, a recent uh, institute uh, that is uh, specific and unique. It's uh, recent. It was uh, established two years ago. OFB uh, does not have an equivalent uh, in Europe. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not boasting about it, but it's uh, the only uh, uh, public institute uh, that can uh, act uh, on uh, the uh, uh, land, river and uh, uh, maritime environment. So there are uh, similar agencies in other European countries dedicated to forest, uh, uh, marine environment, uh, of, um, uh, forests, etc. But uh, uh, the uh, scope is not as uh, uh, far-reaching as uh, that of OFB is. So uh, when we uh, so we discuss, for instance, uh, forest issues uh, with uh, uh, the uh, dedicated agencies in other European countries. And I think that's uh, the beauty of OFB, actually. And uh, we, uh, uh, I was in uh, Marseille, uh, for instance, and uh, uh, biodiversity is about the interdependency of various in, uh, uh, environments, of uh, various elements. And uh, France is recognizing it uh, through OFB. So we're trying to um, have uh, other countries uh, recognize it as well. Uh, because as we've just said, uh, uh, agroforestry, for instance, is uh, one of the um, is one of the uh, uh, elements here, but there's also uh, aquatic life, a marine environment, and all of this is uh, strongly intertwined. Uh, OK, thank you. So we're going to have another question from the room. Say, uh, please introduce yourself, uh, and uh, I will ask our panelis panelists to be quite brief in their answers. Uh, I'm from uh, AGPB. I'm also a, a producer, and uh, I remember meeting Mr. Pierre Dubreuil in, uh, uh, at a congress in Marseille. Going back to agroforestry, I think that we should not uh, forget uh, some obstacles. Um, at uh, the moment, uh, out of a, uh, a farm of uh, 100 hectares, uh, the uh, farmer is only going to own about 25% uh, of it. And uh, between OFB and IGPB, uh, we uh, discussed uh, many interesting uh, subjects, uh, uh, the uh, intercrop uh, and uh, other um, topics. And uh, I think that... Uh, if uh, we want uh, to have uh, landowners and farmers on board, uh, we need to make this uh, uh, much more, um, uh, we need to have a much better incentives uh, in uh, our uh, national plans uh, in terms of equivalence. Uh, and uh, AGPB is a strong advocate of this. And what we also need is stability. We should not forget uh, that uh, in the past uh, we had uh, changes uh, in equivalence for straw, for instance. Uh, and uh, in uh, my region, uh, some uh, crops were destroyed uh, two or three years after they were planted. So I think that uh, we need to have some trust. And if there is uh, no trust uh, between uh, the uh, government and farmers on this, uh, and uh, these policies uh, change every seven years, uh, and so if uh, every seven years uh, we have a change of direction uh, for uh, these uh, um, decisions uh, that uh, 
uh, commit us for the next uh, 25 years, uh, then uh, that's a problem. And there's also another problem. It's a sanctuarization. Uh, uh, when we uh, plant a hedge, uh, we are uh, making a commitment uh, to protect it. Uh, and so I think that maybe this uh, uh, scheme should be a little bit more flexible. Would you like to react to this very quickly, Mr. Dubré? Well, if you um, give me the opportunity to talk about hedges, I uh, could be here until tomorrow. Uh, I'm passionate about hedges. So I agree on stability. Uh, all players say that. Uh, if the rules uh, change uh, all the time, uh, um, it's, uh, it brings uh, uh, about uh, instability. It's true that when you plant a, a hedge, uh, you're really having a long-term approach. However, hedges are fundamental. Uh, they are an environmental infrastructure that is essential. And it's also a way of uh, bringing about more diversity in our landscape that is maybe too uh, uniform. And there are uh, different ways of uh, planting hedges, uh, and we need to do it the right way. And uh, OFB is there uh, to uh, support farmers, to train them on this. Uh, so uh, you should not be discouraged. And uh, stability, well, it's not down to me, but I agree. So we, uh, we can uh, support you in this, and also we can make sure that uh, hedges uh, are uh, planted uh, the right way. And I know that uh, we are uh, pulling out more hedges than we are planting at the moment in France. So we need to uh, look at the bigger picture. Uh, with our recovery plan, uh, we have uh, several thousands of kilometers of hedges that are going to be planted. And uh, uh, well, I'm uh, quite embarrassed uh, when I hear uh, uh, from farmers uh, that uh, they are planting hedges. but. So we need uh, to have uh, seed producers uh, if we want to be able uh, to uh, plant a local uh, um, lo local uh, uh, crops, lo local uh, plants for those hedges. But uh, instead of that, we are imported seeds from China, for instance. So it's a good thing to uh, plant hedges, but it's not just about quantity, but also about quality. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier. We need to integrate uh, biodiversity in the bigger picture, and we need to support farmers. Uh, and uh, I, uh, dive, I uh, dived into uh, the uh, subject of uh, uh, seed producers to understand how it works. And this is what biodiversity and agriculture is. We need to invest in our future. And uh, we need to ask uh, farmers to do things uh, that are feasible. So we can't uh, change uh, the rules uh, uh, all the time. So uh, this is a, a very exciting topic. Just very quickly. So uh, regarding uh, the uh, pulling out of hedges, uh, well, this is strictly forbidden. And uh, except uh, uh, if it is uh, not on arable land, uh, it's still allowed uh, for private individuals. But uh, f um, it's uh, forbidden for farmers uh, to pull out hedges. Uh, and it, it, it's true uh, that uh, it means uh, that uh, when uh, farmers uh, plant hedges, they know uh, that uh, they are taking a really long-term commitment. And this could be an obstacle to uh, this development. So maybe we should have a discussion to find the right balance. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, the environmental uh, inspectors uh, uh, were uh, mostly uh, summoned uh, uh, to uh, deal with um, uh, hedges uh, being pulled out. So uh, uh, it's probably a good thing, but uh, so uh, that was uh, the uh, 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 legal topic of uh, the end of this uh, to conclude this roundtable. So we have uh, just uh, one minute left uh, before uh, we uh, take our break. So I will uh, offer you to say just a few concluding words in turn. Well, the message I'd like to share is that uh, the uh, farm to fork uh, should be relying on an ambitious uh, economic transition. I think that this is what we should uh, be building, and I want to go into more details. 
I think that uh, uh, the uh, what is at stake for the French EU presidency is uh, to uh, find some balance again um, uh, with our uh, food sovereignty uh, while uh, developing uh, the uh, uh, carbon approach. But balance is really the key word here. I've already talked too much, so I will just say that uh, biodiversity needs to be understood uh, by uh, uh, farmers uh, as an opportunity and not a constraint. And this will be key uh, to, um, uh, to for this uh, transition to succeed. Well, thank you very much uh, to the uh, panelists of this first roundtable.